Hey, Naomi, how you doing? Ah, Betty. How you doing, Betty? Good. Good. Slowly but surely, we're all coming back. We're here. Okay. All right. Yeah, we've got about another minute. All right. Everybody have a good lunch? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Hey, Adal, how you doing? Hi, how are you, Chad? Good. Good. Okay. My microphone is How are you doing? Let's see. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, ladies here. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna get rocking and rolling. All right. Um, I'm gonna kind of pick up from this morning. I I had some work to show you. And uh, I'm going to show you a, a Thank couple you. Hey, how are you doing there, Elon? And Very good. I appreciate you doing it. Okay. Anyway, uh, so let's take a look at some of this work. <clears throat> and then, you know, let's think back to this morning about what they were saying as far as you know, some of the dates and some of the times, uh, you know, when these paintings were being done, okay? Uh, like, for example, you know, this very first one. Uh, okay, so this is uh, Agnes Martin, and it looks like, you know, just a blue field, right? But then when you begin to examine it a little bit closer, it's really not a solid blue. What it is, is a lot of like, you know, uh, strokes of blue. And they're all kind of in a row and it, it, it almost sets up like a texture or pattern. There's, you know, like individual little blocks of color. White line. Pardon? White, white line. Uh-huh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's it's almost like a grid, you know, but it's not square. It's you know, it's a little bit elongated. Um, and so, you know, when you look at this painting at first, you know, you just see a blue field, and then, you know, when you begin to look at it more closely, you know, it's not a just a solid blue field. So it's not like they just went up there and painted blue, you know, on the canvas. And you know, that was it. Okay, so there is, you know, a pattern or a texture, but it's it's very consistent, and there's no attempt here at trying to create the illusion of depth or anything like that. It's uh, it's it's really a very flat field sort of painting. Uh, we have this piece. This was done 1935. Now this is actually. Uh, done with wood, you know, to create, you know, a, a relief. All right, so it's it's put down on the surface, and I'm I'm imagining these are fairly thin pieces of wood, and they're they're joined together to kind of create this uh, three dimensional relief on this piece, and then it's just you know painted out solid white, but you know the relief itself you know, kind of gives you a design or a pattern. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's not all just painted. It's, you know, they actually took the time to build up the surface, you know, create, you know, some, some differences in the heights of the surface. Uh, Did they make those themselves or was that part of the, uh, the, the reset, you know, the, the wood itself. I'm sorry, what now? The picture you just showed, 
Right. You said they painted that wood, and I'm looking at the shadow parts of the circle. Is that part? Is that what happened, or did they put that shadow in? Well, no, no, they didn't. They didn't paint the shadow in. The shadow is there because of the light hitting the surface. You know, the the piece itself is just painted solid white, but it's not a flat, smooth surface. You've got raised and lowered areas there, where they, you know, they they cut, you know, like a hole you know, in the wood, and then, you know, part of this is lower, you know, part of it is higher. Uh, the same thing with this edge or this block, you know. One of these are higher, you know, and the other is slightly lower. You know, it's, it's yeah, not- Yeah, that's like, what I was asking, because I was trying to see it. Right, yeah, and so, so if you change the light or the direction of the light on this piece, then the shadows will change. Okay, you know? gotcha. Yeah, because it's, yeah, the, the actual painting itself is just solid white, okay? It's the actual relief in the surface <clears throat> that creates, <coughs> pardon me, creates those shadows and light areas, okay? Uh, this is one of my favorite abstract painters. Uh, his name is uh, Cliff, Clifford Still, and uh, I, I talked a lot about him. Uh, he was a member of a, a group of painters and they, uh, they labeled themselves as what they call field painters, okay? F-I-E-L-D uh, painters. And what they were talking about is they were talking about, you know, painting a visual field. And all of these paintings that Stills did were extremely large. You know, we're talking about, you know, something that would be maybe, you know, 20 feet tall by 30 or 40 feet wide. And when they go, you know, when they hang on a wall and you're standing there in front of them, you know, these things are so large that they basically fill your peripheral vision, right? So it gives you this sense that you're actually in the painting itself, okay? And um, in fact, uh, Clifford Stills has a, uh, a whole gallery room, you know, in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art uh, that's got his paintings on all four walls. And when you walk into that room, they have a bench, but they also have like a handrail, you know, for people to hang on to. Because what, what happens is when you go in there and if you stay a few minutes, you know, and your eyes adjust, you know, to, you know, your, you know, basically you lose any sense of a horizon line. And so it really throws your equilibrium off. And some people get dizzy and have fallen in there mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you don't really know, you know, kind of where the horizon line is, you know, and, and, and so it, it sort of plays with your mind and, uh, and you lose that sense, you know, of, of balance that you have. Because normally when we look out in the world, you know, there are horizontal lines and things running there that help us kind of judge, you know, where we are, you know, uh, what our orientation is. When you step into that room, you lose that, you know, because of these enormous paintings that really, you know, you just get lost in them. And, uh, you know, this is a, you know, this is a fairly, you know, quiet, you know, passive painting by him. Uh, usually, you know, he'll paint and this whole surface will be, you know, covered in paint and crusted and thick. And, you know, he'll use maybe, you know, really not more than usually in like two colors, you know, so he'll use a red, but he'll also use maybe another red, like something that's warmer and something that's cooler and maybe a black right? And those would be the three colors that are in that whole painting. And, uh, you know, I've, 
I've spent some time, you know, in looking at those paintings in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and and they're really incredible because you you do literally kind of get lost in the paintings. And was that his intention? Pardon? Was that his intention, or did it just happen that way? No, that was actually their intention. You know, okay. yeah, and that's why they painted on the scale that they did. You know, to to actually physically, you know, create this visual field so that you felt like you were inside the painting, right? Charles, you remember several months ago, you sent us a link to this young woman who uh, painted the inside of this building um, with letters and it was all in black and white, the floor, the ceiling, the, the, uh -huh. the sides, everything. Do you remember sending us that? Uh, I'm trying to remember her. Uh, yeah, she was a young woman. Uh, I'm not sure if she was from Washington, D.C. or New York. Okay. But uh, she had the same effect, too. When you walked inside the room that she painted, uh, you were, uh, it was all over you. And, um, oh, I know, I, know, I know who she's talking about. Yeah, the she, woman that said she grew up as an outsider in, in her family. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Think, well, from yeah. Australia or New or England or somewhere yeah, she yeah, was, yeah. yes, yes. Okay, yeah, and again, you know, a lot of artists are playing with uh, like a, the a same ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, you know, now, and we'll talk a little bit about this when we get into what more contemporary artists are doing with some of these ideas from you know different approaches to abstract art uh, but yeah that whole idea of having the viewer actually kind of step into a complete environment you know that surrounds them um, so that they really do become part of you know the painting and actually you know the the person who who you can credit with the basic idea of this is actually Claude Monet and the water lily paintings. You know, when, when you go uh, to the museum in Paris, uh, you know, that is really dedicated to his work, you know, you step into a room and those water lily paintings surround you. It's the same idea, mm -hmm. you know, and you're just, you know, you're just kind of lost in, you know, these water lilies. And in many ways, you know, I would, I would say that those are really almost, you know, the very first abstract field theory paintings that were actually ever done. But you know. sounds like a field trip to me. <laughs> oh, okay. Everyone want to pack up and go to Paris? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's go. Yay! Let's go. Yeah. I, though I don't know that they would let us in right now. <laughs> yeah, not allowed right now. I know. Let's, let's yeah, yeah, it's like we didn't do anything, you know. It's like we just want to come. Virus. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, all right. So let's see. This. Uh, okay, the name is covered up. Wow. Okay, there we go. Uh, as for slow, slow, slob. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm butchering the name. Uh, you know, again, you know, uh, let's see what year. This is uh, 1950. All right. Looks if like you, pardon? Looks like an airplane. It like does. Kind of, it? Yeah. Like piano to me. <laughs> yeah, it could be a lot of different things, you know, a lot of different yeah. shapes and things. But yeah, it, it, you know, now that you say that, it does kind of remind me a little bit of an airplane. Uh, you know, or something that's, you know, like on a trailer. Right. And being carried. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like a piano to me. It looks like, a a to me. Me? It looks like an airplane to me. Metro, the Metrodon is Look at right the wings there. and the, bo the, 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 the tail end. The tail. And the, the, the front. It looks like yeah, an airplane. No, no, no. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it can look like a lot of different things. And, you know, but again, now this is what you would probably refer to as what they would call a hard edge painting. Uh, if you look at everything here, it's very kind of precise, very straight, you know, very geometric shapes. 
And again, you know, there's no attempt in any way of, you know, like trying to model any of this color, you know, across this field whatsoever. You know, it's all kind of a flat, you know, the same value, the same mixture of paint, you know, throughout this whole shape. So again, you know, they're, they're not trying to fool your eye, you know, into thinking, you know, that this is a three-dimensional object. Again, you know, it's patterns and, and, you know, movement, you know, directions and things, one thing overlapping another. And, you know, it, in the, in the process of doing that, by modifying the colors, the colors either move forward visually or they move backward. And for me, and it may be different for you, but, you know, for me, the grays seem to move backward, right? The blue and the white and the lighter grays tend to sort of move more forward. So you do get this sense of layering, you know, and even though you don't get this great sense of depth in there, you still get some, you know, some dimension to it. And that's because of the way that it's, the pattern is cut. The blue from the, uh, that's... Right, yeah, one thing... Over that gray it overlaps it in front. If the gray overlapped it, the gray might have been in front. Right. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, this yeah, this this feels like something that's you know the blue is laying on top of, and then the black is laying on top of that. Right. So she is calling this uh, a turbo prop sky shark. Yeah, turbo. Yeah, sky shark. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's the name of the the piece. So yeah, it, it does kind of sound like a it's related to an airplane. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, uh, this is uh, Helen Frankenthaler. Uh, and this was in 1952. Let's blow this up a bit. So can... Now again, you know, she, she painted these very, very large paintings and you can see in her paintings that she used elements of drawing, right? Where she came in with either charcoal or a big block of graphite, you know, and, and laid down some lineal shapes and lines. And then the color that she used generally was very thin and, and applied very liquidy. So, and she didn't paint upright. She painted with everything on the floor. So it laid flat. And again, these are very large pieces. So, so they're similar to a painter by the name of Jackson Pollock. And you'll see some of his work. And she would, rather than just drip, you know, color onto these, you know, she would use some brushwork. Uh, but again, you know, she would kind of work wet into wet and let the color diffuse and, you know, fill these shapes. Uh, again, you know, giving it a very different feeling because it's a very kind of liquid and fluid feeling to most of her, her work. You know, she's calling it mountains and sea, but I see a face. <laughs> okay. Am I the I only one who sees a face? I see a big vase of flowers. Yeah. I see the mouth, the nose, the eye, the, the cheeks, the ear. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, yeah, that that hasn't gotten me as a face yet. Yeah, I'm kind of going more with the vase of flowers. <laughs> I must be the only one. <laughs> no, no. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you've seen that, it, it's probably in there. You know, yeah. in some way. Well, now, whether no, I see the face now. Yeah. In the middle, look at the the uh, is quite large, <laughs> like a Jimmy Durante nose. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're you're kind of breaking up, Gene. So, what can you repeat that? I uh, forgot so, Jimmy Durante yeah, nose. So, so, so the Jimmy Durante uh, nose is it is what it looks like to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you know that's the beauty of abstract. Uh, you yeah. see what you, you see. What you, you know, I, 
everything right. that you're saying, I see in it. I see that it's a landscape. I see the flowers. I see the face. I also see a sailboat going off to sea. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the beauty of abstracts. Yeah. yeah, It's whatever. You can see so much in it. And then you can see nothing at the same time. Right. And the funny thing is, if the artist was there, she'd say, well, I didn't have that in mind. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. that's true. That's the truth. That is so true. But remember, one of our participants paint, paint, painted the trees, and she didn't even mean for us to see any, any women in the trees. And you saw the women. Oh yeah, ladies. I remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sometimes you see things that the artist doesn't even intend for you to see, but they just somehow pop in. You know? mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's you know that really is kind of the beauty of abstract art, and art mm -hmm. in general is that, you know, each viewer. You know, depending on their state of mind and you know their experience in life, things like that, they're gonna they're gonna see those paintings differently, uh, and that happens with abstract, but it also happens with representational paintings too. Mm. You know, particularly you know what I would consider really good representational paintings. You know that leave a lot open to interpretation. You know, from the viewer. Now this is actually a three-dimensional piece. Okay. Yeah, it looks like a sculpture. That's what I was gonna say. Right. Yeah. Yeah, sculpture. yeah, it is actually kind of a wire sculpture. And so it's you know all this wire that's kind of wrapped around, you know, the thicken areas and things like that. But if you begin to look at this and you know, if you walk around it, you can be I can at least, you know, begin to see figures you know, in there, you know, of, you know, people at various scales and, and things like that. And as you walk around, that would change, you know, for you and you'd see different figures. Um, They've got a replica of this at the uh, Albert Knox Gallery in Buffalo, New York. And I saw this there. And it's uh, just like you say, you walk around and you see different figures on there, horse, people, a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really, overall a fairly simple idea in the sense that you know all of the this wire sculpture work was done you know in sort of rectangular geometric shapes you know there's not a lot of curves and you know real sophisticated uh you know forms and shapes in there they're all just you know rectangles and so as you move around depending on how those rectangles intersect you know they become different things for you so it's uh all right here is pollock yeah jackson pollock okay now these were called drip paintings and again you know these are generally pretty large paintings uh and he painted in a way where he painted these on the floor. He would spread the canvas out and then he would walk around, you know, oh, uh, you know, and and drip and spatter, you know, the paint, you know, beginning to bring out, you know, different kinds of movement and direction, uh, you know, throughout the painting. Now for a Pollock painting, this is a, a very colorful uh, Jackson Pollock painting. Because generally he worked, you know, fairly neutral, you know, kind of generally uh, monochromatic, it, you know, with the feeling of most of his paintings. But you see a lot of blue and green and touches of orange and yellow, which are kind of unusual, you know, in his work, uh, because most of his work looked, you know, a lot more like this. And some was even whoop, going the wrong way. Uh, some was even, whoop, I did a bad thing. I made it go away. No, it's still there. It, yeah, I got to go we, find it, though. Yeah, uh, we still see it. We uh, can see it. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad you can, because I can. <laughs> <laughs> so let me go round it up here. Wow. All right. Where, where did you go? In the middle of my screen, if it's yellow. Is it? Yellow, yellow, white, and black. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yellow, green, maybe gray, gray in there too. Yeah. Well, Some kind of gray with another color in it. 
Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad it, it's on you guys' screen because it's it disappeared from mine totally. It says Mel quit unexpectedly. Quick okay. reopen to open. There we go. Okay, so Mel, well, that's the blue one. Yep. All right. So yeah, we'll we'll get back down to Jackson in just a second here. Here he is. There we go. Yay. Okay. Yay. So let's be a little careful about what we're clicking got on. It, but I don't have it now. <laughs> you don't have it? Well, I got the word zoom across of it. Oh. A white Here. zoom. Okay. All right. <laughs> now we all right. Hi, everybody. Okay, so let's go back and share that again. Let me see if we can get back to the right thing. There we go. Everybody seeing the Jackson Pollock painting now? I do yeah. now. Okay. Yes. Good. Yep, yep, it's it. there. Yeah. That was that was the big idea. Okay, so yeah, again, you know, this is, you know, more kind of gray and white. Now he does seem to have quite a bit of color in this one as well. Yeah. Um yeah. I've seen a lot of his that, you know, pretty much so are just almost straight black and white. And um and these things are like really crusty because there's literally, you know, just like piles and piles and piles of paint, you know, on the Now, one of the problems right now with uh, a lot of his paintings is that, uh, you know, he didn't have a lot of money, you know, initially, you know, when he started producing a lot of these. And uh, so he went out to, uh, you know, just like the paint store and used just common household paint to, you know, and a lot of this was uh, like oil-based, uh, you know, paints uh, that he would drip and stuff. The problem is that, you know, the quality of that paint was not really archival. And uh, so they're, they're having a bit of a problem preserving his paintings right now because of that. And, uh, you know, the paint itself is kind of beginning to break down and fail. So I don't know how much longer we'll have, you know, a lot of those. Uh, it's it's kind of sad, but, you know, it's part of the reality, you know, of uh, being an artist. Pink cushion. Yeah. Now, uh, this is uh, Miro. And... Is that an oil? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. Now, actually for Miro, this is kind of, I would think this is one of his really early abstract paintings. Uh, let's see, well, this is 1925, yeah. And, you know, when you look at his later work, his later work is pretty much so, you know, primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. And, uh, and he really doesn't work much outside of that. Occasionally, you know, he'll throw some green or something in there, but for the most part, you know, it's primary, you know, maybe a secondary color occasionally. But this is, uh, you know, this is very kind of neutral for him, you know, with his brownish kind of tone. And again, you know, you've still got some fairly recognizable objects like this X you know, almost like letter forms and things in there. And uh, how big is this one, Charles? I'm not really sure, you know, how large this one is. Now, Miro didn't really, you know, he didn't work on the scale of like Clifford Stills. So I would say, you know, this might be a large painting, but it's, it's probably a couple of feet wide by a couple of feet wide at the most. But again, you know, he's not really trying to create, you know, this illusion of depth, you know, that uh, typical landscape painter or a traditional painter would be trying to create. But he does create these varying surfaces, you know, where some of the paintings that we've looked at, the paint was very, very flat. You know, the application of this is modeled, you know, it's built up. Uh, so it's more almost like a traditional painter. And then he's worked some translucent or transparent layers, you know, over different areas 
of this painting to begin to modify it and uh, you know create some sense of pushing and pulling of the space in there. This is uh, Joseph Albers, and uh, Albers was an interesting paint, painter. He, uh, you know, this is more or less, you know, hard edge shapes. And later on, some of Albers' later work is, you know, looser, um, you know, kind of truer to the materials that he was using. Uh, you know, and bigger, like bigger brush strokes and things and very loosely applied. Uh, but, you know, he, he's pretty much so, in a lot of cases, stayed with this idea of keeping a lot of work, you know, very minimal to, you know, blacks, whites, and grays when you look at, you know, a, a whole body of his work. Uh, you know, he, he got into doing some color pieces, but for the most part, you know, he keeps going back to this black and white or, you know, black, white, and gray sort of arrangement. And uh, this was done in 1933. You know, he painted up until, I think, the 60s or 70s. And uh, his later work was, you know, very different. You know, it wasn't hard edge like this. It was, it was kind of more organic looking. This almost looks like it could be a collage. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, like cut pieces of paper. Yeah. You know, he and uh, Miro, um, and I'm trying to think. Uh, there's another artist, and and they would, in fact, you know, one of their maquettes or one of their studies, uh, you know, they would go into working with colored pieces of paper and things and laying them down and tearing them or cutting them and arranging them, you know, and moving that arrangement around to kind of create compositions. And that's how they would kind of play with the idea of the painting and the composition and, and, and kind of work out those ideas before they got into doing, you know, these larger pieces that were painted. Now, this is one of his, one of his paintings um, a little bit later. Yeah, this is uh, homage to squares, uh, uh, to the square. And I again, pardon? I can't see that one. If you've got yeah. one up there, I don't see it. You can't see a blue? No, it, all I see is just a, a, a blue with a, looks like a frame around it. It looks like one, just a solid it's, piece. Uh-huh, right. That's it. Is that it? That's it. Yes. Okay. Right, yeah, it's, it's kind of a blue, you know, more intense mm -hmm. okay. center, and then it's got another square that's a little more muted, kind of blue okay. green, and then the outside, which is really more green than blue, you know, and again, it's more muted, you know, less intense color. And so the, the uh, square in the center seems to kind of move forward and the other two seem to move backward in space. Is that about what you're seeing, Gene? Nope, I see it, what looks like to me is blue with a little green in it, and then a, a, front, a mat put on top of it. it okay, it, 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 yeah, it's it's squares. Yeah. 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 And yeah. It, and I don't see two squares. I see the blue in the middle with a little bit of green color in it. Uh -huh. it is, Okay. That's what I see on the yeah. anyway. But then there's another square around that, and then there's an even bigger square around that. Well, I don't see. I just see two squares. The blue huh. square and the square right next to the blue square. That's the only two squares I see. Okay. You don't see the green, the flat green part? Yeah, you don't see the... Uh, the biggest part of it is the green. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Well, no? to me, it just looks like it's, it's gray, a dark gray. The whole the the, the the mat with the piece in the middle. That that, that that's the only wow. three shapes I've got. Okay, yeah, it is. It's three it's three squares. Well yeah, okay. Yeah. Well the piece of paper is the first square, that's that's what I see. Okay. Well squares, Well you're you're yeah, you're you're pretty much so seeing what we're seeing. <laughs> okay. There's not a lot there. Well, I was playing tricks on me. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, there's there's three squares there. You know. Okay. Uh, let's see. And then this piece, oh, um, this is Lee Krasner. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Krasner was a New York artist. Anyway, this is done in 65. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, again, you know. That looks like he was a fabric designer. Yeah, it, it's a very large piece again. You know, it's it's not quite as big as like Clifford Stills, but it's, you know, it's it's a very, very large piece. So again, it does sort of, or functions sort of the same way, where because of the scale of it, you sort of get pulled, you know, into the painting itself. Now, when you start looking at this piece, you know, you see parts of the raw canvas showing through and then you've got paint, you know, brushed on and applied, you know, almost like in a very traditional uh, process. So, you know, big, bold, you know, paint strokes, you know, creating forms and shapes in varying colors. And, you know, depending on how the color was mixed, you know, certain parts of this painting sort of move forward, certain parts kind of push back, you know, and there's always this back and forth uh, sort of tension, you know, in it. Uh, this is uh, another one of Krasner's paintings, you know, more monochromatic, but, you know, real active, you know. Um, you know, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of things going on. A, a little bit of blues and, and lavenders. Yeah, there's a little, yeah, a little red, a little blue yeah. kind of popping through in areas, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I think a lot of that, you know, he would lay in uh, uh, like loose colors and then he would work back over and then let some of that kind of come through. So again, you know, the, the painting is built up, you know, layer over layer. Uh, okay. I could, this, this was a black and white piece. And, uh, oh, how big they are. Yeah, it's called, you know, WNYC radio station mural. Okay. Okay. And, uh, you know, as you look at this, you know, you begin to see musical instruments, you know, musical notes. You know, some of these could almost be like faces, things like that. But again, you know, just sort of whimsical, sort of abstract, you know, shapes and lines. And they suggest to you that, you know, there are musical instruments and things there. Yeah, they, it looks like there's a record up there in the back too, a shape for a record, like a, like a record. Yeah, like, yeah, it could be, yeah, like could be a record, could be a symbol, it could be, yeah, right. yeah, lots, lots of things. You know, just like that could be either like part of a drum, or it could be part of like a cello or something like that. You know, the, the base of it. So, yeah, like most of these, you know, you can you can see a lot of different things. Now, this is Mark Rothko. Now, for me. You know, I, I've always really, really enjoyed uh, Rothko's work. Uh, you know, again, he was like Clifford Stills, a member of this group that they called themselves field painters or field theory painters. And again, you know, these pieces, you now in Rothko's case, they weren't nearly as large as Stills work, but they were still, you know, very large paintings. And so you would stand in front of these and again, they would sort of fill your, you know, your whole field of vision. And in Rothko's case, they're very much so like landscapes, you know, because he always used this arrangement of, you know, horizontal, you know, uh, you know, placed rectangular shapes kind of loosely laid in. But we well, have a window shade on a window. <laughs> could be, yeah. Now, the thing that was interesting about Rothko is, you know, you might see this green, 
Yes. You no, know, and it's probably the same green, but it's layered, you know, one layer over another over this, you know, black or bluish background in the back. And he used a, a painting process that he called scumbly, right? And so there was paint in the brush and he would take it and he would work the paint into the surface, uh, you know, layer over layer. And in some places, you know, he wouldn't work as many layers over it, so it wouldn't be quite so opaque as in this area. It would feel more transparent. Like a scumbling so, over, over it? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of how he produced these. You know, these were painted with a very, very large, almost like a house painting brush. And again, you know, he would load the brush and then he would kind of scumble or, you know, keep scrubbing it, you know, into the surface, you know, one layer over another and building up those paint surfaces. So again, you know, you got this, this kind of texture or this layered feeling to the, the paint and it wasn't like laid on as a big solid block. And that, that was very intentional on his part. Um, this is another. Uh, yes. You know, another art class that I have, uh, mm -hmm. when you, I was told that um, if you're doing faces and the only thing you have is acrylic to take most of the paint off your breast, uh, off your uh, brush and do, you know, you're, if you're trying to paint your face, you know, do, do the scumbling in the background color and do, then do the other colors you just scum very lightly and they will blend more easily. Right, yeah. Yeah, scumbling is a process. Uh, it's, what you, it's what painters generally refer to as creating what we call open or broken paint passages. And what that actually means is that the initial color that you laid down, uh, like in this case, right, may be this red, right? Um, you know, so he'd lay that down and he'd work over it with this other color and he would build it up slowly and let some of that red show through, you know, throughout, you know, the, the area. And it, it's, oh, I don't, I no longer see the artwork. You don't? No, sir. Well, again, like that other one, that's just a square. Of uh -huh. right now, just see, now I just see you, I don't see anything else, just you. Okay, well, all right, here, let's no. All right, we'll, we'll try this again. It's okay. hard to see the colors. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know what's going on with this uh, today, but it seems to be cutting in and out. There you go. There you go. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, so, you know, again, you know, these areas are kind of built up layer by layer. You know, it's, again, you know, he's not attempting to just take a big brush and, you know, paint everything out. You know, he's intentionally wanting to let some of the color from underneath, you know, show through, you know, as he's building up these paint passages. So, and what is this, and, and what is the technique called again? Scumbling. Scumbling, okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, a lot of contemporary modern painters use that. Uh, again, you know, if you're using acrylics in particular, it's an effective way of kind of creating softer transitions of color. Mm. You know, uh, almost where with oil, because it's wet, you can blend it, right? With acrylic, you know, the layer that you had put down there an hour or a half hour, 45 minutes ago, is pretty much so set up and you're not going to blend those colors together. So you're going to be building up the color slowly and just kind of softly feathering it in to the other color to create this illusion of a gradation, right? So that's scumbling for you. That's what I was told. <laughs> okay. Well, you were told right. That's what it is. All right, same thing here, you know, again, you know, pretty simple idea, you know, it, it looks a lot like a landscape, but, you know, when you start looking at these, again, these are not like big, solid, flat colors. He's not trying to create flat shapes, 
you know, he's, he's building this up slowly, layer by layer, and kind of letting you see, you know, what was originally underneath it. You know, the same thing up, up in here to, uh, you know, whatever degree he wanted to. And so it, it begins to create different kinds of very subtle movement and shape in there. And these are really fascinating to look at. You can, you can look at them for a long time and see lots and lots of different stuff. Uh, somebody you guys are probably familiar with. Picasso. Yeah, Pablo Picasso. Okay. And when you start looking at this piece, and uh, I'm not sure what year he did this, you know, but I'm guessing that it was probably like in the 50s or the 60s. Uh, again, you, you see a subject, you know, it's still in a sense representational. You see a woman and, you know, she's sitting in a chair, but he's not trying to fool your eye and tell you that she's, you know, three dimensional or anything. It's again, you know, these are very, very flat shapes and patterns and that's, you know, totally intentional, you know, on his part. You know, he, again, you know, he's not doing a traditional approach to painting. You know, he's not trying to make it look as, as though it's anything more than almost pattern and decorative like. Uh, this is another one of his pieces. And you see the difference between the two? More sculptural here. Yeah, this is more dimensional, right? Because he's used, again, that technique, scumbling. See, to begin to kind of create, you know, these gradations and these transitions, right? And this becomes, you know, a, a very three-dimensional form almost, even though we know it's a, a flat canvas. And not only in here, but, you know, on, on the surface itself, and then, you know, in these different, you know, graphic areas, none of them are you know, solid, flat applications of paint. You know, they're all built up, you know, layer after layer. Now there's one of his uh, much earlier pieces. And, you know, one of the things I think that a lot of people forget about Pablo Picasso is that when he first started out, you know, he worked in a very, very um, traditional way. And this would have been, you know, a, you know, a pretty typical painting for him, you know, in, uh, you know, in his early days. And this was done in 1905. So it's right at the turn of the century. And, you know, he's still painting, uh, you know, pretty representational images. And to go from this and then create this whole different approach to art. And that was the thing about Picasso is he went through all of these transitions and created, he, he by himself created whole art movements um, and influenced a lot of different artists. This is called Le Demoiselles. And this is probably one of his, you know, most famous paintings. And again, you know, this is where he had moved from something that was totally representational. And now he's moved into, you know, early stages of cubism where he's beginning to flatten out the shapes. And, you know, you can still see female figures there, but, you know, look at what he's doing with, you know, a lot of these faces. You know, these are very reminiscent of like African mask almost. And he's, you know, the idea of cubism is that you're not just looking at, you know, the subject from, you know, one view, but you're actually seeing it from multiple views all at the same time. And that's what he was working with there is trying to show you, you know, what's going on around that figure, you know, all the way around. 
Yeah, you know, I remember uh, in art class about a million years ago that someone was telling me that what he was trying to show was that the left side, just because it's in shadow, is as important as the right side. So he showed that too. Like the, like the table shouldn't be in shadow just because it is, but it shows the importance of everything that's in the art. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that was kind of the idea of cubism. You know, you're looking at it, again, from multiple directions all at the same time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he did, uh, he did a lot of theater pieces that way. He did, also did a lot of still lives, uh, sort of the same way, you know, playing with that idea. And in fact, a lot of artists picked that whole idea up. And there was a whole group of artists that called themselves cubist you know, artists. Hey, Charles. Yes. Uh, there was a program on TV a couple of years ago with Antonio Bonetis, uh -huh. Tony Picasso, and it, it brought in, it was his whole life, but it brought in all the elements uh, of the change in, in what they were doing and the artists. It was quite well done. Yeah, I hadn't seen that. I wonder if it's out there. Yeah, the it, it was, a, yeah, Ontario Banderas was, was okay. great. Huh. I'll have to look for that. <laughs> Yeah, P Picasso was a really interesting character. Uh, and there's, you know, a, a lot of things you could say about him, but the, the one thing that everybody can agree on is that, uh, you know, he was very innovative. He was always looking for a new way to approach, you know, creating art. And uh, very much so trying to create art that would be reflective and representative of the time, you know, that, you know, that he was living in. And he really did, in many ways, move the whole art world, um, you know, in, in the sense that, you know, he, he came up with these ideas and these pieces of work that influenced many, many, many artists, you know, for generations to come. So. And he's still influencing, you know, artists today. Again, you know, this is, uh, I think this is 1903. So this is, again, is very, very early. You know, he was very young. And uh, again, you know, this is one of his, one of his signature pieces. Um, and it's, you know, the, uh, the guitarist. Okay. And then, We've talked about this, well, we've seen this guy's work, you know, in the video earlier today. This is uh, Pete Mondrian. And again, you know, working primarily with, you know, primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, black and white. And, you know, all of his paintings were done with just those colors. And they were always kind of these, you know, hard, rectangular shaped paintings. Uh, and he would compose them, you know, and lay, lay out that, you know, that black outline or grid and fill those colors in. And unlike, like Mark Rothko, who was trying to model and scumble and create uh, some kind of texture or surface, uh, Mondrian was laying everything in there in a very flat way. You know, he was, he was really trying to be very careful and let all those colors be consistent. He wasn't really trying to, you know, create any sense of modeling on that surface whatsoever. Because when you saw this, he wanted the colors themselves to be the thing that would, you know, either help push forward or backward in the process. Uh, okay, yeah, this is Robert Motherwell. Again, you know, painted very large. Uh, Motherwell, for the most part, you know, was another one of those painters who didn't use a lot of color. You know, he used, uh, you know, primarily black and white. You know, he would leave large parts of the canvas uncovered. Uh, which would create a contrast, you know, between the white and the raw canvas itself. So he actually used the canvas as a color. 
this is uh, this would be a pollock, right? Then you can get all right. Is that the one we saw earlier? Uh, we saw something similar to this, yeah. Okay. I think it had more yellow. This is that more orange spot. So. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, yeah, this is a, another uh, Russian artist. And again, you know, this is very, very graphic. This is probably not a large piece. But again, you know, working with you know, flat shapes, patterns, textures, you know, and creating, you know, grayscale by cross hatching or, you know, just laying in pattern. So again, you know, he's not trying to model color or anything like that. It's, it's all very, very kind of flat. Now this is uh, Kandinsky's work and we, you know, they talked about him uh, again, he's kind of credited with being, or had been credited with being really the first abstract artist, but we now know that, yeah, maybe not, you know, we'll, we'll give that honor to, a little further, that's all. Yeah, to uh, Hilma Off Klimp, or even uh, Claude Monet, or, you know, some, some even earlier artists, you know, back in the, uh, you know, around mid 1800s, some of the work began to get, you know, really quite abstract at that point. But at the at the time, they wouldn't have called it abstract because, you know, that that term hadn't even been, you know, coined or invented, you know, in a way to describe art. Uh, this is uh, William de Kooning. Now, de Kooning, a lot of people, you know, talk about uh, his work and his work was always about the female figure. Everything he ever did, it was always uh, female figures. Now, not, not necessarily easy to pull out of there and see female figures, but, you know, I that, pardon? I said, I, I see one particular one. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can actually see uh, a lot of different female figures in there, and there are. Yeah, there are a lot of artists, you know, uh, particularly figurative artists who have sort of followed in his footsteps. Uh, one of them is a contemporary painter by the name of Cecily Brown, and uh, yeah, she's an interesting painter, but now. A lot of people accuse de Kooning of not not liking women, and you have to kind of wonder about that. Because <laughs> if he if he didn't like women, then why would he spend his whole career painting nothing but women? Never painted male figures; they were always female figures, uh, and very abstract, you know, very very loose like this. Could be uh, a self portrait. Could be a self portrait too. Maybe see yourself, how you might want to see yourself. Okay, you you you, th you think he was trying to find his uh, feminine self? Yeah, well, I said, yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. Yeah, like like I said, you know, you can you can put you can read a lot of things into a piece of artwork. So, but yeah, I uh, there were there were quite a few interviews with him. And, you know, in, in talking to him, you know, some of these people who were interviewing him, you know, actually sort of accused him or started this idea that, you know, he, he didn't really like women um, because of the way he painted them. But the fact is, yeah, he, I, you know, he really, uh, really cherished women and and really loved painting them it, it was that's what he did his whole life and uh again you know you can kind of look at this and uh, begin to see almost like a face and it's you know it's very distorted you know it's not you know he didn't try to make it pretty or anything like that uh, so and that's kind of where those 
those ideas began to evolve that he didn't really like women. I don't, you know, I can't, I can't find any real evidence of that in anything I've read or, or seen on him. And uh, I know, you know, me personally, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend my whole life painting something that I don't like. So, <laughs> anyhow, so that's, that's it on the, uh, and, on it, all, and, and it all, may be that you think a woman is more than what they look like. Uh-huh. You know, yeah, women. I think it has more to do with, um, uh, you know, trying to create some kind of emotional response, you know, to the painting itself. Uh, so now that we've kind of covered that, I'm going to jump into some of the things that you sent me. And uh, we're going to begin to look at those. And uh, well, that was all very good. I appreciated that, Charles. So this is, uh, this is Avital's final large painting, you know, the larger painting of this head. And, I like it. Huh? I like it. I do too. You know, the only thing is I kind of would have liked to have seen her, you know, push the color in there a little bit more. Yeah, why did she take all the color yeah. off? I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you, you know, see uh, me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're, yeah, we're talking bad about, about your painting here, Abigail. No, that's the move. That's, that's the move. move. Light in the areas. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Finally, I, I'm sorry. I, my, uh, my volume was down. Oh, okay. But uh, yeah, my my comment was, you know, some of the studies, you know, that you did. I really like the way that you really pushed the color in there. And maybe you don't need to go that far, but I would probably push more color in there than that. That's you know. That's just me. That doesn't mean you have to do it, okay? Oh, why did you take the color out? Oh, I like it. I would have liked to have used, instead of the yellow, yellow jauntas, I, I would have liked to have seen a little more orange or red or something to, to make him look healthier. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Who is this, Avital? So, so, so let's let Avital tell us, because I think... Uh, lady asked her a good question you know which is so why did you decide on the final piece to be more subtle with the color uh, 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 actually it's the reverse i have decided to do the sketches after this one because oh. as i said i was not quite uh, willing to destroy this one with the experiments so i started to do little sketches the colorful sketches, but they came after this one. This one was the first one. Okay. And um, and because I was not brave enough, I put in in I invested enough time and effort that uh, I, as you can see, I was very cautious. But I stopped mid mid work to do the little experiments, which were not satisfactory. And I guess that's why I kind of got stuck. Okay. So you didn't you didn't like the results of the uh, studies that you did later? I did, but not not entirely. No, okay. they were too kind of too simplistic. There were two colors. I wanted um, a little nuance of maybe Wait. orange. Hello. Okay. So would you? Are you giving up painting? That's your final man's hand. I'm sorry. This is says a final head. Are you right. giving up painting heads? Well, no, no, no. It's it's like it's like the finished piece. Okay. Yeah. So when I say final, that's kind of it's the final piece that she submitted, the larger piece. So my question is, now that you've done those studies, are you thinking about or considering going back in and and pushing the color in this a little bit more or Yes. Or is this kind of done? No, I, I would very much like to continue. It doesn't, you really have to, I, I jokingly say, you have to have a magnifying glass to see what's what. It's hard to see. Uh -huh. uh, and so, yes, I definitely would like to develop it more. 
Okay. All right. Well, if you do, you know, then, you know, kind of share that with us, you know, as you build up the color. Because, uh, yeah, we'd like to see kind of where you go with that. Okay. okay. Uh, who, who is the guy? Um, I, I will have to have supply the picture. It was a, um, a magazine a photo. Oh, okay. A, ah. scene, a, a person that was working in the sea it looked wild. It kind of looked uh, a little naturalistic, overly natural, naturalistic. Okay. It's beautiful. Yeah. It is. I like it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then she also sent in this piece. Now she pushed the color on this one a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, you can still see some of the elements of the original drawing. And then she layered color over there and she's, you know, over the, a lot of the skin tones. Uh, and she's still working very transparently. But again, you know, building up the color. Now, you know, same question, are, are you kind of at the point where you're not going to be pushing any more color into this or varying it in any way? Is this kind of finished or is it kind of where is this in in your in your own mind? Yeah, if, if you notice, Charles, when I sent it to you, I, I wrote anemic. <laughs> I use the word anemic. In uh -huh. that words, it's not, doesn't have, in my opinion, it should have more color and I would like to develop it. But again, I like, so far, I like what the expression, I like. Yeah, the female has a lot of expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. thank you. But, but I, so again, with watercolor, you can ruin it. And once you cover it up, very, you can still take off some of the paint, but right. not all. Yeah, well, and a lot of that would depend on the paper that you're using as, as to how watercolor. much. Watercolor. Yeah, but the paper, with watercolor is really important because you yeah. can work on paper that can be worked on that's very wet and still push it around and modify it. Or you can work on, you know, um, maybe paper that's not so good that's not going to hold up, you know, to lots of washes and layers, and, you know, working back and forth. So the paper will determine a lot of that. But, um, you know, my thought is this. You know, uh, you know, the child's face and the mother's face, you know, you, you've built up a fair amount of color and stuff in there. If I were going to do this, I would want to create some contrast between like the skin tones and the figures in the background. And so the way I would approach that is I would actually lay in, you know, more color in the background and try to push generally the value of the background darker yeah. you know darker than they are again uh -huh. so it begins to sit back and they sort of emerge out of it. uh and that's just kind of my thought but you may you you know you probably have a different idea uh yeah. but that's kind of how i would probably approach it because i think you know you've got a lot of really nice things going on you know, in, in the form of the face and the figures. <clears throat> and all this piece really needs is, you know, again, just a little more punch, a little more contrast to it. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go back in and rework the figures. A lot of times you can use the background as an element. By pushing it darker, you make them lighter. True, true. Yeah. I certainly, I risk less by doing that and right. still get the effect of contrast, uh, which is a good idea. I, it's a very good idea. I yeah. will certainly try that. Okay. And it is watercolor, a watercolor paper. All, all of my watercolors are done, I'd say, 95% on watercolor paper. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I know, you know, I don't work in watercolor real often, but, you know, the, the paper that you're working on really makes all the difference in the world. <laughs> It's okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's, now we've seen this before. Eloise has sent this in a couple of times. And this is uh, Miami. Yeah, Miami. Yeah, it's well, the, Miami. Right. And she sent the painting in earlier. Well, yeah, I think it was Monday. 
and she had started over again on it and uh, she was trying to get more of that effect of the light and the discussion that we had was about putting more you know pushing more color into these areas of the foreground and she did that in her painting and uh, I think it really helped a lot you mm -hmm. know to begin to yeah just to begin to kind of you know push this area forward and then let this area kind of move backward see so now again you know what I was saying to you Eloise was you know just putting a little bit of more intense color in here has really pushed that forward now I would caution you because you kind of got you got these intense reds way back here in sort of what I would call the middle ground and I would probably tone those down a bit again letting the color be more intense here now that doesn't mean that you have to get rid of these it just means that you just got to quiet them down a little bit uh, and you can do that by is this acrylic Eloise? no it's no it's oil it's oil okay so you could glaze over it uh, and just kind of glaze that down until it becomes a little more neutral and begins to sit back for you. But it's like right here and right there. Yeah. You know, as it moves back again, you know, mute these colors down a little bit. Uh, and it will help whatever's up in here become more intense. Again, you know, reinforcing that idea of that as color moves back in the distance. Uh, you know, it's you get less intensity okay her sky is beautiful yeah thank you uh, i think i overworked the clouds this is my third uh picture mm -hmm. so i it and good. it doesn't like it. look thank you it doesn't look the same way to me as when you show it on the screen the photograph it looks different yeah well it's reduced. different good or different bad yeah so different because, good. It looks the photograph looks much better than what I see it. I don't okay. know why. I mm. can't understand that. Uh, well, again, it's you're looking at it reduced on the screen. Oh, and so, I see. Yeah, so that that can sometimes play with the color. Now, uh, you know, we hadn't really talked much about this, but you know, in the clouds themselves, you know, you're getting a lot of color and stuff in there. Um, but all of the paint is like very direct sort of paint strokes and stuff. Uh, I would kind of think about that a little bit. And I would kind of, again, you know, if you want this to be sort of the more important part of the painting, then I would leave it the way it is and leave those edges sharp. If you don't, then I would soften the edges down a little bit, just make them a little softer. So, they can still be there. They can still be the same color, the same value. But again, just softening them will again make them less important and, and keep your focus, you know, down here. Okay? Because right now the hard edges up in here are kind of competing with your harder edges down here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's 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 that five types of contrast. All right, so uh, this is Elsie Jester, and she was painting her daughter. I'm going to start with this one. And um, I think, yeah, I think this is the painting that she, that she kind of started with. And she wasn't happy with it. And, uh, you know, personally, you know, I, I understand what she's trying to do. She's trying to paint her daughter and get a likeness of her daughter. And so she may not be happy with that. But overall, you know, I really like the painting. So, um, Very. you know, because I don't really know what her daughter looks like. And so, you know, I'm just looking at it as a painting. And um, and I like the feeling of it. You know, the pattern nice and, the color and, and how that kind of fits into the background of all the flowers. She looks beautiful colors. Beautiful. I love it. She looks real friendly. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, now, as I said, she wasn't really happy with this painting. So... I think she's made a couple of more attempts. And this one is kind of blurry, mm. you know, but I think she's trying to get a little more expression, a little more likeness of her daughter in the face. 
and this is uh, this. I think this is the same one. It's just not. Okay. Which, media, which media did she use? Acrylic oil. Um, I'm thinking it's oil. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking it's oil. Could be wrong, but uh, yeah, I'm thinking this is oil paint. And just looking at you know how she's kind of handling it. I, I would say probably well. She developed the hands a little more in this one. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, that and, that and the sort of the personality of the face. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think she's probably getting closer to a likeness of her daughter. I, again, I have met her daughter, so I don't really know. But, you know, she, this looks like a more developed, finished painting of the face than, say, the first one. See, this, this is a little flatter, you know, not quite as rounded. So I think she's a little more successful in that sense that this looks more like a three-dimensional head. And so I'm, and I, you know, I'm guessing, you know, that maybe she's going to go back in now and paint in the background. You know, now, now I like the back. neckline on that one. You, you like the what? The neckline, the way she did uh -huh. the neck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think she's got a better understanding for the anatomy with the mm -hmm. collarbones kind of overlapping and mm -hmm. the neck coming back and then the chin and the front of the face moving forward. So, so yeah, technically I think this is probably painted better than, than the first one. But again, you know, I still like the first painting. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'd like to see what she does, you know, if, if she does the background. On this, and uh, kind of see where she goes with it. Uh, June uh, sent in a bunch of drawings, and we'll talk more about those on Friday. I'm just going to run you through them real quick. But yeah, uh, I'm not sure where she's getting the reference and things for these figures. But you know, she's working a lot on doing you know faces and figures and things like that, and she's she's improving quite a bit. Yes, she uh, is. You know, she's got, got a figure, you know, seated there on a stool. And then, um, and this is a... The horse. Yeah, this is the horse that she sent in a couple of times that we never got the drawing part of it, so it's a drawing. And, uh, you know, I think she did a really good job at, at, you know, kind of capturing the movement and the feeling of the horse in the drawing. Now, when she got down to the painting, the proportions got a little kind of wacky. Well, that, yeah. yeah, it's not quite as strong as the drawing. And so, yeah, she needs kind of a little more powerful neck and more weight sort of in the, uh, the hip and the leg area of that horse. Because wow. you know? uh, right now it's kind of like the proportions are, you know, a wee bit off when you compare it to the drawing. I mean, that, that to me looks like a powerful horse, right? Which it is. Yeah. And this to me, mm, not so much, okay? So it's, it's just a matter of really looking to proportions of things. And, you know, it's not a lot of repainting. It's, it's just getting, you know, those, the thicknesses of the neck and the weight in, in the shoulders and the front of the legs and the back of the legs. Uh, this is a, another painting she did. And I really like this painting. I like that. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it's a sunset on the beach. And, uh, you know, it, and you would see that, you know, it's like the, it's what we would refer to as the violet hour, just as the sun goes down, how the, the sky goes kind of reddish. Right. And, um, you know, and, and you could imagine, you know, being at, you know, the shoreline and watching, you know, this all turn kind of this reddish purple that the, the water kind of shifts, you know, and, it, and you actually see more of the green in it and the figures running around, you know, on the beach. I don't think she's here, so, uh, so she can't tell us that much about it, but hopefully, you know, later this week she'll be around We'll, we'll talk about it more, or next week. And this is Naomi. 
And, uh, you know, Naomi has been, you know, putting in these kind of hard to find shapes in all these faces. And she's getting a little more paint on this, um, but also she's softening. And I like the feeling of this, you know, much better than what she was, you know, what she had turned in earlier. Like the placement and the colors are beautiful in that. Yeah, Naomi? Yes. Here, here. So, so tell us a little bit about this. This this looks like one of your earlier paintings, but you saw- No, you know, I did it the other night. Uh -huh. it's, it's, this was uh, on a, an acrylic paint, painting, a watercolor painting that I went over. It was red, it was all red and I went over this. Okay. With watercolor. And, with watercolor or with acrylic? No, you know, I have a heavy hand with the watercolor. Okay. This is watercolor. Yeah, well, even though you've got a heavy hand, you know, this this face still has a much softer feel to it. You know, and I, I like the fact that you haven't outlined all those shapes. Yeah, and, and I'm getting away from that. Well, the next one's very outlined. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the clown. My clown. Well, yeah, but this is done with color pencils, so it's still, you know, really lineal in feeling. Um, but yeah, you haven't overdone the outlines and things in this even. So so you're you're softening them, and that's good. Yeah, I like him. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is sisters. Uh -huh. This is, oh, uh, well, I messed up the Asian girl. See, the third from the yeah. left. Right. But mm -hmm. I didn't want to start. I was tired. I didn't want to do it again. But that is called Sisters. Okay. Women of the world. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, you got a little bit of everybody in there. So that's good. I don't have a Latino in there, though. Uh, mm -hmm. No, you don't. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, though, you know, uh, Latin people come in. Oh, really, sizes. Yeah, a little, you know, a very wide variety, you know. Yeah, but their color, I should have done the Afro American. A woman a little darker, and then done a light uh, Latino. But I was tired. This is yeah. late at night, so. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I've, I've met Latin women who actually have kind of reddish hair, and and can be very fair skinned. You know? Well, that's because they're very mixed. My uh, daughter-in-law's uh, parents are from Colombia and Peru. Uh -huh. And when you see people from Colombia, South America, yeah. they are so mixed. Mm -hmm. It's unreal, very mixed. But Peru is uh, the indigenous people were smart. When the Spaniards came, they ran to the mountains. So yeah. they look very uh, Native American, you know. Okay. But anyway. well, yeah, well, again, you know, if you, if you ever travel to Peru, you know, they, you have a lot of people who still look ethnically very indigenous, but again, they have a very, very wide uh, and very mixed, you know, ethnic range of people. Well, there. certain areas, yeah, but they, yeah. a and lot they, of them look uh, very indigenous, very interesting. Yeah. My daughter-in-law looks very, uh, very uh, native, yeah. you know. Okay. Yeah, kind of Mayan or Aztec or, you know, something like oh, that. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, just as a side note, you know, uh, Peru also has a very large Asian community. You know, they've got a lot of people from uh, China and Japan who have moved to Peru. Yeah. Don't ask me why, but they but they did. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's a very ethnically mixed country. Um, and then, yeah, this, this is a little more in keeping with what you were doing where, you know, these, these areas are more graphic and a little bit harder. And I really, again, you know, kind of like more where you're going, you know, with that and softening. Yeah. You know, the color can be there, but it's, it's kind of like the color or the shapes take over. Yeah. You know, I Peter, see what you mean. Yeah. Naomi. Naomi. Yeah. I like the boldness you have uh, with, with your name. Most times people just put a little, little thing in the corner, but you make your name a part of the art. I love that. That's, that's my personality. 
I'm very <laughs> short, but I'm bold. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. All right, and then um, is Wanda here? Yeah, but that's not me. That's oh, Bernice's. that's beautiful. That's Bernice's. Uh, yeah, you know, but, there's but, a movie about this very famous woman. Uh, it's. Yeah, I but, recently saw the movie about her. She Harriet is Tubman. something. She went back to. She escaped by herself hmm? to. I think was it Pennsylvania or Maryland, and they said, "Well, how'd you get out?" She said, "By myself." She went back to the plantation that she escaped. She saved 70 people. She is fabulous. Mm -hmm. This woman is very special. Yes, she is. Yes, very, very. But I was inspired by uh, you showing this, and then I saw the movie, and then I looked it up in Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia. But she is a very admirable he heroine. Well, she, she, Naomi, she is actually the mother. I call her the mother of my soul. Oh, hey. she's she's very, very brave. So brave. But 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 but, but what you're looking at, actually, though, Charles told me that the background railroad was too light. Yeah. So did, did I overdo it, or did I do it just enough? No, no, I think it's good because now you see that as railroad tracks. Okay, and, and then the lantern. But, but you see, see the symbolism on now. Yeah, they're, they're railroad tracks, but you see they still sit behind her, right? So they don't really compete with her, right? I did, I did notice you had emphasized the tracks in the back. That gives right. the whole picture a little, yeah. Yeah, so that really, really helped kind of complete, you know, the whole story. Beautiful, beautiful portrait, beautiful. Okay. Nice. Nice, Bernice. Very nice. All right. Beautiful. So, so Wanda, am I wrong about this one, or is this yours? Yeah, that's me. That's you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Good. All right. I didn't. I didn't totally mess it up. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, and and I really like these, and and I kind of, you know, changed the title on them. Uh, you know, I just called this one Grace because it kind of started with some of the, some of the first words. Oh, okay. Can uh, you enlarge it, Charles? Pardon? I can't read it. What does it say? Uh, it says, it's knowing God always has my back. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. And now these are with yarn. Yes. Yarn. The whole dress is yarn. Her hair is yarn. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the, the picture is, uh, is, is a fabric. Okay. And it, is it on watercolor paper? or? No, that's on a canvas. On a canvas. Okay. And Charles, now, can you make it larger? Okay. Yeah, I can. It's already on the whole screen, but okay. Okay. I say. But, but you know what I like about this picture, Charles, is the way she does the um, background. She does so many. She does the leopard skin. She does another skin. Then she does the lace. Like she mixes so many different things together. Like she has a piece of wood on each corner. Uh -huh. You know. Yeah. Well, that's. that's the thing you would think would, would, would go together at all. Yeah, well, that's why that's why they refer to this as mixed media. Yeah. Thank you, Brit. Thank you, Bernice. Yeah, because it, it, it's 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 uh yeah, she's got different pieces of fabric here, kind of creating the borders. Yeah, and it, I don't know how she put them together. Yeah. Yeah, I mean they're really fun pieces. You you know you 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 see the overall image, but then you kind of get into the you know the actual materials and how it's. Yeah constructed and put together. And that's that's really the fascinating thing about Nixpedia is that some of this stuff is really surprising uh, about what's in there and, and the effect that you can get by using, you know, all kinds of like found material like bottle caps or pieces of old glass or things like that and recycling them, repurposing them. You know, everything okay. around the house. Yeah, to very nice one. Thank you. Yeah, this is yeah, that's a beautiful piece. And then these are. Uh, oh, I love that. Yeah, these are really fun. Now these, these are ceramic pieces. Right. Well, the this part ceramic, and then these are actual. Are these feathers? Or? Yeah, those are feathers. Okay. And yeah, and all the embellishments and stuff are pearls and gold and right uh, and different things like that onto onto the surface, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. And yeah, again, 
you know, really, really expressive. You know, Beautiful. they both all have a lot of personality and just really fun pieces. How, how big are the actual heads? Uh, the heads are about maybe 10 inches. Okay, so they're they're pretty good size. They're not. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did you do the ceramic pieces? Yes, well, I used a mold. Uh -huh. And do you have them hanging up in your home, Wanda? Yes, I do. They're this very nice. Come on the wall, yeah. Oh, it's on the wall from, okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, now I see it. There's a gold frame next to it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, you have yeah. a very nice wall of all types of art. <laughs> oh, yeah. You go. Yeah. Okay. Can you read that? I can't read that. Uh, okay. It says, meditating while having faith in God's word gives inner strength and great comfort. Very nice. Yeah. Very and, lovely. you know, I like, you know, she's got a very relaxed pose. You know, she's sitting there. She's got her, her book, you know, her Bible open. And, you know, she looks like she's deep in thought. Mm -hmm. And um, Bernice had mentioned this, you know, with the use of the lace. Yeah. And the the leaf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a really nice kind of mixture of, of different materials and things. Uh, and it makes a, a really kind of striking image. Um, and again, using... Now, is this yarn or is this fabric? Yes, right? everything in there is yarn. Uh, except for the lace going around. Her hair is yarn, the chair is yarn, her dress, everything is yarn. Okay. Is the face painted? Yes, the face is painted. That's a, that's a, um, acrylic? No, it's the, uh, the pen. Um, Those watercolor pens you have? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. very nice. It gives you a lot of control over small things. It small does, things. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, Wanda, do you, uh, you draw all of these things first, and then you uh, enhance them by putting the different fabrics and yarns on top of them, right? Yes, yes. They're beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Now, let me, <clears throat> let me ask you something, okay? Because when I'm looking at, like, the dress, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you get a really nice, sharp, plain line here. So are you taking the yarn and putting it, like, are you cutting out a piece of paper or something and then wrapping the yarn around it? Or how, how, are, you, how are you applying the yarn to the surface? Uh, I'm uh, gluing some yarn and other yarn is going through the canvas. Okay. Uh, yeah, because this looks like it's going through, mm -hmm. right? Okay. You use a needle? Yes. Okay, because I was going to ask about the polka dots on the white part of her collar. It looked like it's, you would have to needlepoint that. Those yeah. small pearls, I put them in individually by using um, hot glue. Black pearls? White pearls. Oh, I'm talking about the color of her dress. It has the black and Oh, yeah. those, 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 are, those, those are sewn in, yes. That's okay. all sewn in, yes. That's all sewn in, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, got the pearls here and here. And maybe maybe up in the hair. Yes. So, so this, I, I painted this picture about 10 years. I did this picture about 10 years ago. Mm. Okay. Very nice. Thank yeah. you. I like, I like the way the edge goes underneath her dress, the edge of the, of the chair and everything, and come back up on the other end. Yeah, it makes, oh, it, yeah. makes it feel kind of dimensional because mm -hmm. that's what I was asking her about, you know, how she kind of got this clean edge right here. You know, because mm -hmm. it, it would be real easy if you just glued these down to make this look real flat and to not get that, you know, sharp, clean edge on. Someone, so, so, someone just come in, she needs to have a one-woman show because her <laughs> stuff is so unique. Yeah. yeah Thank you, Bernice. That's, that's nice. right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right. Right and now. Then, <laughs> and then we looked at this uh, earlier this week. And one of the things, you know, that I had kind of recommended is that she come back in and she darken, you know, some of these lattices. They were really, really pale. Yeah, they were. And see, now it's like the, the grass out here begins to look like there's sunlight on it. And these begin to kind of fall into the shadow. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the comment that I made to you, Wanda, was that, 
you see these diagonals right here, the gray? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if you just push those just a little bit darker. Oh, a little more yeah, darker? Okay. Just again, and yeah, the idea is a little bit. Because you see, if you make them the same value as the brown. Okay. And see, you've done it down here. And see how they kind of hold together here? Oh, yes, but, yes. But here, they seem yeah. like they're in front of, of the brown. Okay. And, and they seem lighter, like there's some light or something in them. So mm -hmm. if they were just a little darker so that they're the same value, then they would kind of hold together, you know, as that piece of lattice. You feel kind of like it's all the same thing. Okay. And then you would get that effect that we were talking about of, of having these, all of this are, like okay. kind of in shadow. Okay. Okay. Yes. You know, one, one, the, one, one that had complained that she couldn't do landscaping, but I think she did a beautiful job. I see the perspective of everything going backwards and everything. And, e and even the brick wall, how it gets smaller and smaller. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that landscape. Yeah, Thanks, Bernice. Yeah, this is a really nice piece. You know? Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's, it's right there. You just need to kind of push it just a little bit more. Okay. 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 All right. And then, and then we have this. Oh, like, yes. Okay, so tell us about this. You've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> this was a, a drawing from a picture and of a young woman smiling. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to uh, replicate it a little bit, just put my little spin on it. And uh, everything's in pencil, except for her hair, which is in charcoal. Okay. All right. <laughs> and so, um, all right, and you did this more recently, right? Yes, I did this yesterday. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the only thing I would say is um, you're getting a, where, where is, oh, uh, there it is, okay. See where the cursor is? Yeah. Okay, right in here. Mm -hmm. When you come to the hair, you get into the background, right? And, and it seems to have kind of like a halo, you know, something moving around her head. Yeah, that was what was on the picture. Okay. Hmm. Not quite that big, but you know. Um, so, you know, so. So was it lighter, like right up against her hair, or? Yeah, it was. It was just a a, a, a edge going around. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because it's okay. It's what I. Because the picture my... didn't have a color background. The picture was a white background, and oh, then had right. that little halo going around it. Okay. All right. Mm. Yeah. If it. Okay, again, it, it's your piece of artwork. You do with it what you want to do. But for me, you know, I kind of find that a little bit distracting. Okay. Uh, you know, because it looks kind of like, you know, you kind of came up to the head and you didn't want to get right up to the hair. Um, yeah. And, and so it, you know, it's, again, it kind of mirrors that shape of the head again. Oh, okay. You said, you said blend that halo more into the background? Right. Yeah. So I would take okay. some blue and I'd, I'd bring it, you know, up closer to the hair. Okay. You know, okay. so that you don't get, again, that halo shape. And I think if you could, you know, kind of build up your uh, blue background back there mm -hmm. and, and bring it all the way up to the dark of the hair. Okay. And then that wouldn't become that important and you would look more right here at the face where you really want to look, okay? Oh, okay, I got you. All right, good idea. I'll do that. Okay, so yeah, that's, you know, kind of about the only thing I would, you know, kind of recommend on it. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, so guess what, kids? <laughs> that's it. Yeah. yeah. That's that's all the work that was that I that I collected that you guys had sent in. So uh, we'll be back here on Friday morning at ten. Okay, and if you have drawings and things uh, that you want to submit, a child. Uh, yes. How late can you submit work? Because I think one thirty. Is that is that too late to get it on? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Try, try, try to get it in by one o'clock, say. Well, try to send it tomorrow. Oh, okay. Yeah.
See, and that and that way, when I get here around about you know eight eight thirty in the morning, I have time to download all of these. And um, some of you, some of you have been pretty good at picking up that idea of naming the the image file. Some of you are not doing very well with that. Okay. Because I, because I don't know how to. I don't know how to pull up the the the, the uh, uh, address for the picture. It's because my picture is on Google, and I don't I don't know when I pull the picture up. It it doesn't give me that address. Uh huh. So you you have all of your pictures stored like in the cloud or something like that. Uh, maybe I'm not. Sure. I just know they're on Google. I'm not sure about the cloud, but I know they're on Google. Okay. Right. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So when I put them down, I don't, I don't see an address on them. Well, it's not That's an address. Don't worry about it. I'm, I'll, I'll read some more and figure it out. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a file name, okay? And so you can, you can change the file name. Um, and like I said, if you, if you use your name and then like an underscore or a dash, and then you can give it a title. And then as long as it ends in JPEG, or well, JPG, okay. you know, you don't change that part. Don't change, you know. That's the part that I'm not seeing, that JPG, uh, what's the other one? Uh, ping, P ping. Yeah, that's the part I'm not seeing. I, I got to figure out uh, where it is. Yeah. That, well, know. don't, if you're, if you're not seeing it, don't worry about it. Just, again, you can just, you know, name it. You can call right. it whatever you want to, okay? All right. Um, Charles. Yes. I have an iPhone. All my pictures are on the iPhone, and they don't show a file name, so I don't know how to do that. I just forward them to you, and whatever you get is what you okay. get. And if it doesn't have it on there, I don't know how to put it on there. Yeah, so you don't you don't download them. Uh, no, they're just on my phone. I just forward them to you. Okay. All right. Well. Again. How would I download them? Download them to a separate file, build a file with them in there or something? Uh, are you on a Mac or are you on a PC? I'm doing it from my iPhone. I'm on a PC now. Right. But the pictures are on my iPhone. I understand. Okay, but you see, you can take, uh, there's a cable. Let me see if I can show you. See, you've got your phone and there's a cable, right? A USB right. cable. And if you plug it, into the USB port on your computer that connects the two and you can I've done that. I, I have downloaded my pictures to the computer, but I always use the phone to work with them. I didn't do I need to go on the computer and send them to you? Well you could if you're sending them you because you're sending an email, right? Do you ever send Yeah, I'm sending an email from my phone though. But I okay, I have them stored on my desktop. Uh -huh. But I would have to go to my desktop to get them, and I just use the work all the time on my phone. I just back it up on my computer in case okay. of loss or something. But I can do that. Go yeah. to my computer and send it to you from the computer instead of the phone. Yeah, you could. And, and the thing is, you know, on your computer, you can look, you know, at all your pictures, right? And you can go back in, you can rename them on your computer. Um, in your photos on your iPhone, mm -hmm. um, I don't know how you would. They don't it. have names; they're just photos. Yeah, they're well. They're well, they have they, dates. They they do actually have names. They've got numbers. It's image, oh. you know, image, and then dot. Oh, you know, I've never, a, I've a never seen that. Yeah, on my or phone. image dash, and then a number, and then dot JPEG. Or ping or whatever they are. Um, on the on the screen you had displayed, I think JPEG on that. So you just added that yourself, right? Well, no, I didn't add that. All I all I added was the name, and I gave it a title, and I left that alone. Okay, I put my title on there, and I also put my name on there. I just didn't put the date, the file type on. But yeah, and you don't. Yeah, and you probably won't have to, you know, because it's already a JPEG. But as long as the name and the, uh, and you know, your name, and then whatever you want to call the piece, and even if you left it just the number, that's fine. You don't have to change that. The main thing is get your name on there, and then that way 
I won't make that mistake of like taking Bernice's work and accredit accrediting it to Wanda. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't mind. <laughs> but I don't mind at all. I know. <laughs> Thank I know. you. I know. So. But, 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 but I, I have an, an Android. I think I think when I got the phone, uh -huh. I set it, I set it up so it's synced to my computer. And when I yeah. take a picture, it automatically goes on Google. Mm. Right. Okay. And so, see, somewhere in there, if you can figure out how to get into your photos on Google, you know, mm -hmm. you can re you can rename them. You know, okay. you can move them to different folders and and save them. You know, different ways. So, yeah, it's it's just a matter of getting used to how how to find them and navigate there. Okay. okay, but any of these file names on a on a computer, you can change. You know, you can just kind of click on them and rename them. They don't they don't have to be what they are. Oh, I don't, I, don't, I the rename rename is not the part. What I'm I'm what I'm having a problem with is is that the section name or whatever. But I'm, it's a kind of, you know, the JPG or whatever it is. That, that's the part I have the problem with. Yeah, well, and again, you know, just don't mess with it. You know, okay. leave, it, leave it alone. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, you don't, want, you don't want to change the type of file that it is. You just want to. Okay. Yeah, the file name. I, mean, I have to look for it to find the file name, yeah. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the only thing you're changing. Okay. Okay. All right. Any, anybody got any more questions about stuff like that or if not then um i will say goodbye and we will too yes and we will see you on friday friday okay? all right bye everybody all right, all right. thank yes. you Thanks. goodbye bye bye the week. A class in 15 minutes <laughs> all right bye 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 veronica bye 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 thank you